Right, so how do we fix the system? We've seen, you know, we've seen the housing impacts, we've seen the environmental impacts, we've seen all the other you know, negative consequences of allowing private banks to create money in this way. Okay. So to figure out how we fix it, we need to go back to these three questions that we had at the beginning of the day. Firstly, who should create money? How much money should they create? And how should they use that money that they're creating? So at the beginning of the day, we said that we had this uh, conflict of interest when you have, you know, if you were to allow Gordon Brown to just create money out of nothing. Um, the same, you know, you've seen how well that can lead to in Zimbabwe with Robert Mugabe. Um, but we also have this conflict of interest in the current system where we allow the private banks to create money because the, the incentives that we have at the bottom are driving people always to lend over, you know, and lending is creating money. So systemically they're biased towards always inflating the money supply and creating far too much money, more money than the economy actually ever needs. And this is the track record of the banks. You know, since they really got control over the money supply in 1970, and this has just come completely out of control, and it's ended in the crisis that we've seen over the last few years, and which is still ongoing. Okay, so we know from history, from track record, the system's tried and tested, and every time it's been tried, it's failed. So we know that we can't allow the banks to control the money supply. But what about if we were to allow these guys to control it? We can't allow these guys to create money. They just have too much of a conflict of interest. So that, that doesn't leave us with much options. We can't trust profit-seeking bankers and we can't trust vote-seeking politicians. What we need to do, and this is critically important, is that we separate the decision over how much money needs to be put in the economy and what that money will be used for. So when you, when you go to a mechanic uh, to have him look at your car, he'll tell you how much oil you need to put into the car, but he's not going to tell you where you can drive. Um, and you know, deciding how much money the economy needs is generally, it's quite a mechanical, uh, technical, statistical process. You know, you figure out where we are at the moment, look at a lot of statistics. If it needs more money pumping in, then you can put some more in. But as soon as you combine these two decisions, you have a massive conflict of interest. So you've got to have a complete separation. You've got to make sure that people who are deciding how much money to create don't actually benefit directly from creating that money. Okay, so the best option that we have found after weighing up all the different pros and cons of all these different options is that you allow an independent body, um, separate from political influence, separate from the influence of lobbyists. And what we believe is that the Monetary Policy Committee is probably not perfect, but one of the best options that there are within the current framework. So these guys would stop manipulating interest rates in the way that they do at the moment, and instead... Um, they, okay, so there, there will be no political influence from government. That means that George Osborne can't ring up and say, look, guys, we've got an election in a year, and I could really do with some help. Um, we don't want any of that sort of you know, political manipulation of the economy. They need to be accountable to Parliament, so accountable to the broad body of MPs, but not the ones that are actually trying to win the next election. And you need complete transparency over these decisions, just as you have transparency over how interest rate decisions are made and they have to announce their, um, their reasons for voting the way they did. Um, you would have that with regards to the money supply as well. Okay. And for the first time in history, you'd have control over money out in the open. It wouldn't belong to the king, it wouldn't belong to vote-seeking politicians, and it wouldn't belong to uh, profit-seeking bankers. How much money should they create? Well, this is the situation where we are at the moment. There is more debt than there is money. So if we actually took all the money that we have and use it to pay off all the debt that we have, then this is what we'd be left with. A lot of debt to the banks, about 300 billion, and we'd have absolutely no money to keep the economy running. Um, so there is a need for the government to put new money into the economy so that we can pay down these debts. Okay, the, there's another fundamental point as well, which is that creating money doesn't create any new resources. It doesn't bring any more oil out of the ground than is already there. It's not going to give us any more coal than already exists. So all it can do is divert resources from where they're currently being used to where this new money is coming into the system. If anything, it usually distorts the economy. The only real exception to this is that if you have a situation where you have a lot of you know, unused resources and there's just not enough money flowing in the economy, then if you put in some new money into the economy, then that can stimulate 
um, well, economic activity, basically. And that's the situation we're in now. We have, a, you know, we have two and a half million people sat at home doing absolutely nothing because the economy has ground to a halt. And that's because there isn't enough money circulating. So we do need to put some money in to get this system going again. And that money needs to come in and be spent by real people. And um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so if we can put that money into the economy in such a way that it gets down to the high street rather than the financial sector, then it might actually start to stimulate it. We might get jobs, uh, we'll lower unemployment, and we'll actually, you know, the economy will improve. So, so basically, the, the principles are you create money when inflation is low and steady. Um, low and steady, generally, in economist terms, they usually mean 2%. There's an argument maybe it should be 0%, but the consensus at the moment is inflation should be about 2%. So if inflation is ticking over at 2%, then you can keep putting money into the system. If it starts rising above that, and it's not purely uh, for you know, foreign reasons like oil is getting more expensive than that, it's actually due to monetary reasons, then you want to hold off putting money into the system. And the easiest way to think about this is you know, if you're driving a car on the motorway, when you need to speed up a little bit, you put more petrol, you, know, you put your foot on the accelerator. But you don't keep it flat at a constant speed. You ease off when you're approaching the car in front. Or at least I hope you do. Um, so this is kind of, you know, it's a very sort of gentle process. Put in a little bit, put in a little bit more, put in a little bit more. Okay, the economy's doing nicely now. We'll ease off. We'll just wait, see what happens. A little bit more. And we shouldn't have this like you have with interest rates where we, it goes up to 5% and then it drops to 0% and then it's back up at 5 again. Um, it should be a much smoother ride for everybody in the economy. And if you do this, then you prevent this Zimbabwe uh, or Weimar Republic style inflation um, because you have a natural lock-in. If inflation is rising above you know, 4%, then the Bank of England wouldn't be allowed to put new money into the system um, to, you know, to stop this getting out of hand. Okay. So how should they use the money that they create? Well, okay, what would you do with the money? You spend more into public services, cut taxes, pay down the national debt, or just give it directly to people. You'd probably do a, a combination of all of them, you know, because there's um, certain things are appropriate in different scenarios. But one proposal that we would potentially put forward is that you do the following. You use this money to... Okay, so there's a big question at the moment over whether the government could adequately handle a load more new money without potentially wasting it. You see a lot of big projects where a lot of money has been wasted. Um, and simply pumping more money in through there will, you know, you'll have high-speed rail, which is a, a very controversial pr proposal in itself. Um, but all these things will be paid for with created money, uh, which is not necessarily what we want. Um, what we would suggest, potentially, is that if you really want to stimulate the economy, there's two things that I think you can do. Um, and we're still working on this proposal. But Firstly, you can cancel VAT, because VAT is a tax of 20% on everything that people spend, almost everything. And that tax applies to people who are actually earning too little to hit the income threshold. So even people who are living on £5,000 a year are still paying tax at 20% on that spending. So you cancel VAT, you've got basically prices will... Okay, so businesses are probably going to keep a bit of that tax cut. And they're probably going to lower taxes a bit as well. So you might see taxes come down by 10%. Consumers are 10% better off because things are 10% cheaper. And the business gets the other, maybe the other 10% for themselves. So businesses are getting more money through the front door that's not going straight into um, the treasury, which is going to allow them to employ more people, to expand and to become less dependent on, um, on bank lending. And then you can raise the income tax threshold. And what you can do is lower, basically get the lowest percentage of the population completely out of tax. And what that will do is stimulate the economy right at the bottom. Because people who are earning less than uh, 12 or 14K a year generally don't use their money to go and buy bonds and stocks and uh, financial assets. They spend it on the high street. So if you can get money down here instead of straight into the financial sector, then you might see your recovery within 12 months. Okay, so how does this new money get into the economy? Well, if we're suggesting that we put it through the government, even if you cut taxes, then this newly created money covers the, the lost tax revenue. Okay, so it just compensates it. Um, 
so then, you know, you, the, the government will pay local government employees, uh, government departments, any contractors for these departments. And gradually, that money is basically being spread across, you know, 10 or 15 million public sector employees who are then going to go and spend it in the shops. And then, you know, other businesses and on things we actually create. So, as the government starts creating money and putting it into circulation, obviously restricted by um, the Independent Monetary Policy Committee, this money is going to go, you know, it's going to spread through the country, it's going to get down to the bottom, it's going to be on the high street, it's going to allow people to actually pay down their debts. And when you do that, you'll suddenly find that you have an economic recovery. And we, we don't need... We don't need more lending because we don't need more debt. The crisis was caused by too much debt. What we need is more money to pay off the debt. Okay. Right, so this is what would happen to the money supply. This is um, another version of the chart that I showed you earlier. The red line at the top is the total amount of debt that we have to the banks. The green line is the total amount of money that we have in the banks. And from 1991 there, you can see this is you know, sort of getting out of control. Um, what would happen if we keep the current system is that these two lines are going to keep going up, um, probably more slowly than they have been to now, but the debt's going to keep rising and the money supply is going to keep rising. Um, if you allow the state to create money in the way that we're suggesting, then this new money comes into the system, so the level of money keeps rising, but it can be used to pay down the existing debts, the sort of debt overhang or the debt hangover. Um, and it's the only way, pretty much, that you're going, to be allowed, you're going to be able to reduce the total burden of debt. So maybe by doing that, by getting money down to the high street, because okay, when it comes to lending to businesses, don't forget that not all business investment has to come from the banks. If a business is doing well, then every year it should be saving a bit of what it's receiving, investing that to grow. So the reason that, we're completely, you know, that businesses are completely dependent on bank lending it mean, doesn't mean that we need to get the banks to lend more. It means that there needs to be more money in the economy so that businesses are less dependent on bank lending. So maybe if we're getting money into the bottom of the economy in the way that we're suggesting, then you can do this and get rid of a load of this unproductive, socially harmful speculation which is going on at the moment. So the ideas that we're talking about, fixing this system, is it radical? No, it's not radical. Um, and it goes to the roots, radical. <laughs> Yeah, it goes to the roots, but it's actually, all we're doing is making the system work the way that most people think it already works. Most people think the Bank of England is the only one that can create new money. Um, and this, we, we get the question a lot, well, you know, has, has this been tested anywhere? And, or is, it, is the current system that you're proposing in use anywhere? And I have to say, no, it's not in use anywhere at the moment. Most countries are using the same system that we're using right now. And most countries are also basically collapsing under the weight of the debt that they have right now. I'll come back to questions at the end. Um, but it was actually tried. Um, this was tried 160 years ago in a, a small island uh, nation. And basically what happened at the time was banks had, at that point, they were able to create paper money. And they created paper money because people believed it was a receipt for the cash that they had in the bank. Over time, people started to use the paper money instead of the, the metal coins that they had in the bank. And then they forgot that the paper money wasn't actually money in the first place. So once the banks realized that they could create money, they started printing more and more of it, making more and more loans. That pushed up the prices of property and other assets. And it basically caused a, a bubble that went you know, apart and um, ruined the, the economy. So this was, um, this was back in the 1840s. And the, um, the country in question is called the UK, well, the island in question. Um, and it was a conservative prime minister who passed the legislation to stop this to take the power to create money away from the banks. So this was in 1844, the Bank Charter Act. But there was a, a major uh, loophole in this, which I think might be highlighted, um, which is if you look closely, it says an act to regulate the issue of banknotes. Um, obviously at that time they didn't foresee that banknotes would be superseded by checkbooks and then by Visa and MasterCard and then by internet banking. So. So the law currently stops banks from creating their own paper money, but it doesn't stop them from creating electronic money. And in fact, we haven't updated this law for the last hundred and nearly 70 years. Now, 
ever since then, whenever the Bank of England creates paper money, they get the profit from doing it. So they, they print a £10 note, it costs them a few pence to print it, and then they sell it to the banks for £10 um, at the face value. And that difference between what it costs to print and what they can actually sell it for is something called seniorage. Um, or slightly different if you are good at French accents. But, um, <laughs> but it's been a significant profit in, in recent years. 2007, 1.65 billion. Um, this is money going into the Treasury and it's, le it's taxes that we don't need to pay because it's a different income source for the government. Uh, 2.33 billion, 2.19 billion, um, 491 million in 2010 for technical reasons, I think. Um, but basically, this is, this is substantial. I mean, this is 120,000 nurses in 2009. I'm not sure why, but everything is measured in nurses. Um, <laughs> But this is, a, this, is a, this is a hell of a lot of health care that's been paid for purely from the profit of creating money. And yet, because the government's given the power to create electronic money to the banks, and because we're now using electronic money for 97% of the entire money supply, we're losing... Let me see. Yeah, here we go. We've lost $2.1 trillion in government revenue to date. That's 2,100 billion pounds. Um, it's basically enough for a three-year tax holiday on all taxes whatsoever. And it's twice what the national debt is. Um, so if you look at the financial situation of the government, of course they're, they're, they're struggling now because they've given away this huge source of revenue to the private banking sector. Okay, so we, um, one of our supporters who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, he's written to Mervyn King and he said, do you not think maybe, given everything that's happened, it would be a good idea to update this law. And he wrote back and said, I don't know if you can read it that well, but it, he said, second, uh, you suggest that banks should be forced to conform to the underlying purpose of the 1844 Bank Reform Act. You might be aware that I've said publicly that I think ideas in this spirit, such as those advocated by John Kay, seriously merit serious consideration in the debate as to how we reform our financial system. And I remain sympathetic to those views. Um, incidentally, he then says um, he doesn't want to prejudice the Independent Banking Commission's uh, decisions. And I showed the Banking Commission this in a presentation that we did to them about why they should be looking at our particular reforms. I tried to get that red line to cover of the line of text, but they still read it. <laughs> it's like... Okay, so that's the idea. Um, the state takes back control of creating money. It stops the banks from creating money. It puts money into the system um, in such a way that it will get to ordinary people rather than being pumped into the financial sector. Bypasses the banks. The banks will have to wait until we've used it and we want to lend it back to them to, to invest in other things. Um, and it's all it's inflation proof because we have this lock-in that stops the, um, the Monetary Policy Committee creating more and more money if there is inflation. Um, and it's really important to have that. This isn't just a fluffy idea or something that we've been thinking about over the last couple of weeks. It's something that we've spent about 18 months working on, to the extent where we've been able to put it into draft legislation. I mean, one of the problems you have with government and civil servants is they never have any time. So to save them the time of figuring out how you fix this, we did it for them. We wrote this into, into law, into the format that could be passed in Parliament tomorrow if, if we had an emergency vote on the subject. And um, you can also get these outside, also available on the website. Um, but this is very, very watertight and very substantial. Um, and it's only actually about 40 pages to fix the entire banking system and end the crisis, which I think is quite an achievement. <laughs> so. You need to get banks to ask our permission before they can lend our money. Right now, you put your money into the bank, it becomes their property, and they can do it whatever they want with it. And we want to set it up so that you have two accounts, um, or two types of account. If you want the bank to keep your money safe, I mean, keep it safe, like not go and lend it to somebody in subprime America without a job, then you put it into your current account, and that money will just sit there until you instruct the bank to to pay that to somebody else by using your debit card or your internet banking. If you're willing to take a risk, then you can say to the bank, look, I don't need this money for the next 12 months. 
I want you to go and invest it. I want you to try and pay me some interest. So this is what uh, Simon mentioned here, this distinction between current accounts and investment accounts. And the reason why this is so essential to do is that if you set banks up in this way, then when one of them fails, all the people here who said, I don't want my money to be put at risk, those accounts, the money is still there, and th that money can be moved across to a healthy bank. And these people who said, okay, I understand there's some risk in lending, um, so I'm going to take that risk, then those people can wait to get their money back as the bank is liquidated, like, like any other businesses. And it means that we don't have to, I mean, with, when RBS failed, the reason we had to rescue it was because all these people who thought their money was genuinely safe in the bank suddenly discovered that, you know, it wasn't going to be. It would disappear. And that's why we had to bail out these you know, toxic corporations that really should have been allowed to fail. Okay. Second thing, we need to make them tell us how they'll use our money um, if we provide it for them to invest so that they can't be using it to, um, well, to invest in things like cluster bombs, in things, like, well, in things that you're not ethically comfortable with and so that we get some control over whether that money goes into pure speculation or gets directed towards business. Um, if you want to find out more about that, there's a longer video on this particular subject, on the DVD and on the website. So just very quickly, the benefits, I mean, I think you've seen the harm that this system is causing across the space of today. The benefits, we would have no more bailouts um, with a system like this, which is integral to the reforms that we're proposing. We'd have no more subsidies. Banks would actually have to stand on their own two feet as you know, capitalist businesses, just as your local corner shop has to survive without government subsidies and, uh, and bailouts. Uh, there'd be less poverty, because instead of putting money, new money into the financial sector, it would get down to the, the ground, you know, onto the high street, where it would actually create jobs and stimulate businesses. Therefore, there'd be more jobs. That's not unemployment, uh, the debt will be falling. This is the only reform that you can do that will make a significant impact on the current levels of debt. Uh, there will be less inequality because you don't have this systemic redistribution every single year of interest from the majority of people who are in debt to the small minority of people who are actually in a good position. We get control over our money. You wouldn't have pacifist funding bombs. You wouldn't have environmentalist funding Canadian tar sands. And we'd actually reclaim some power over what's happening in our economy. We take back power from the banks.